Welcome, everyone. Uh, as you can tell by my smiling face, I'm delighted to be with you today uh, here at Flyleaf Books uh, to bring you our first Humanities in Action event of the spring 2021 semester. This is a review of the 2020 election with Dr. Sarah Trill. Uh, as you can tell, we are still in COVID-19 protocols. We're so happy to be able to have this space here at Flyleaf Books where we did our Humanities in Action programs obviously for, for a number of years. Um, so it feels a little bit like normality, except for um, I'm looking at nothing but boxes and books and my dear colleague, Paul uh, Benici. We have a lot of people to thank. Of course, I want to thank the CPH staff, uh, the Carolina Public Humanities staff, Paul Benici, who does so much hard work uh, getting this uh, ready for you uh, to, to be able to access out there in the ether. Uh, of course, Vicki Breeden, who does a lot of work behind the scenes, is behind the scenes right now monitoring how this is uh, projecting for you. And our registrar, Brian Ensminger, who does great work making sure you have a spot at the table today. We need to thank our sponsors, the Cotton Merca Group and Morgan Stanley, who have been sponsoring our programs, especially our Carolina K-12 programs for a number of years. Uh, we're really uh, grateful for their support as well as Carolina Meadows, a retirement community in Chapel Hill who supports both our public programs and our Carolina K-12 programs. And of course, our partners in publicizing, promoting events, uh, and help sponsor these programs, in particular, the General Alumni Association. For anyone who is not a member of the General Alumni Association, line up, sign up, and get involved. Uh, of course, um, I want to explain briefly to you uh, who we are at Carolina Public Humanities, if you are new to our program. Uh, we are the dedicated public outreach arm for the College of Arts and Sciences, and it's our job to be a bridge between the faculty and scholarship at UNC and the wonderful communities of North Carolina. And uh, we do that through three ways, these public programs. I'll mention a few of them in just a moment or two. Um, of course, the other ways we reach these communities are through our community college outreach program uh, and our uh, very extensive Carolina K-12 program for teachers. Uh, we want to just let you know that if you'd like any information about uh, any of these programs, what we do sort of outside for other communities, the Carolina K-12 and community colleges, please go to our website at humanities.unc.edu and check that out. A few upcoming programs. Uh, this is the first public program of our regular running CZ, uh, series, so of course check out our other Humanities in Action events coming up, some of which will be done from Flyleaf Books here, some of which will be done in a more virtual setting. Uh, Adventures and Ideas seminars are coming up. A great roster of seminars, including Escape to Magical Lands. I think that was our idea of, I think everyone wants to get out of the house. Well, you can at least get out to some magical lands of fantasy and science fiction uh, with that wonderful uh, seminar. We also, of course, have Dr. Gerhard Weinberg coming back to do World War II in the Pacific. Uh, we have a wonderful look at religious freedom throughout the world and a whole host of other events. I also urge you to uh, check out our new series, Lunch with Friends and Strangers, a biography series, uh, and that'll be starting up on February 12th, a, a wonderful event where we look at uh, one person who you might not know or might know in great detail, and we've had a great fun with that, so please come and join us for that. And finally, there is one very special event tonight. Uh, and I'll be, uh, host, I'll be uh, opening up that event in, in just an hour and a half or so, and that is a uh, cultural look at the at 2020, a postmortem, a cultural postmortem look at 2020, done in collaboration with uh, CU Boulder and the University of Iowa. So those are all events. Please check out humanities.unc.edu. Check out Facebook. Check out all of our uh, uh, ways of reaching your emails and whatnot. And line up and sign up. We'd love to have you on board. Now for our talk, humanities in action. Uh, we are really delighted to welcome Sarah Trull, Associate Professor of Political Science, whose particular research focus on Congress, the courts, and state delegations to the federal government give us a great basis for understanding just what happened. Uh, Sarah has worked with us many times, has a history of doing these sort of election previews and reviews with us over the past four years, and it's just a great delight to have her back. It feels like that's one normal thing that we can do, is review an election together in these odd times. One other thing I just want to mention about uh, Dr. Trill is she is also the director of the new Program for Public Discourse on Campus, and in that capacity, we'll be doing a lot of the type of outreach work that we do here at CPH, and we look forward to working together on some projects in the future. Without further ado, please, I'm going to grab a disinfectant here, just like the inauguration, where that one guy's job was to do this. Please welcome, without further ado, Dr. Sarah Trill. The 2020 election, what happened? What is next? Take it away. <laughs> 
Great. Thank you so much, Max. And thank you, Paul, for being behind the scenes here. And thank you all for coming to my talk today. Take off my mask as I was instructed. Um, sorry, I forgot about that momentarily. I'm finally free. I really appreciate you joining me today. I'm sure many of you are well aware of everything that took place in the fall of 2020 and, of course, the months leading up to that and then the time since. But I'm using this hour today, hour and a half, to review some of what happened, my reactions to it, where I think we're going, uh, the context of the presidency, the Congress, and also particularly an emphasis on the political parties. So I present to you the 2020 election, what happened and what is next. First of all, a recap, right? So when we think about the 2020 election, a few things that I'm gonna focus on in more detail here throughout my talk. First of all, the Democratic primary. Then we had the pandemic, different methods of voting, and what I mean by that was going to see many changes that occurred with results um, of the pandemic, right? We needed new ways to reach out to voters, new ways to make voters feel comfortable turning out during the election, and different states handled that in different ways. This is, of course, going to lead to other questions about where we go from here, right? What does voting look like in 2022, 2024? Then I'm gonna cover the presidential debates very briefly. Then we'll talk about election day, which of course turned more into election week. And then I wanna move into 2021 with the Georgia runoff elections. And then of course the January 6th attack on the Capitol. After that, we'll talk more about what's next. So the elections, what happened in those elections, but why did it happen, right? What does that mean for the president, Congress, and the parties going forward? So this is essentially the template for our talk here today, and I wanna make sure I leave plenty of time for questions. Many of you are, again, well aware of everything that happened, and I wanna make sure that we can answer your questions about what is going to happen into the future. So starting with that list that I covered here momentarily, um, the first 2020 Democratic debate saw 20 candidates qualify um, for that debate. I'm sure many of you watched it. The stage was crowded. Um, there are names probably on your screen right now that you don't recall even having had run or you had forgotten that they had ran. Um, this was more candidates that we saw even in the Republican primary in 2016, which if you recall was continuously remarked upon how many candidates there were. A large number of candidates were obviously vying to unseat Republican President Donald Trump. The Democratic primary timeline ended up being pretty interesting too, and this is something that we'll come back to when we discuss changes that might happen in elections in the future. So I already said that more than 20 candidates emerged. Most counts put that number at 29. Then on February 3rd, we saw the first caucus, the first primary, if you will, as always, the Iowa caucus. Here I wanna note a couple of things. The first thing is that current president, Joe Biden, finishes fourth, a disappointing fourth. There were also numerous delays that you may or may not recall, so hopefully this is kind of taking you back to last February, delays in reporting the results of that caucus. So much so that some people started to ask whither the caucus, right? Will we continue to see caucuses into the future? Are caucuses a good method? Should Iowa go first? Now, many of these questions are asked year in and year out anyway, following a presidential election. But this particular year, given the fact that the Iowa Democratic Party was utilizing a new app, the app did not work very well, there were many problems with reporting, and the fact that we didn't get results right away might lead people, or lead people, excuse me, to have even greater, more in-depth conversations about whether or not caucuses, and particularly the Iowa caucus, should retain their place in our electoral process. Next, on February 11th, we had the first official primary. New Hampshire holds a primary as opposed to a caucus. And here, President Biden finishes fifth, so even worse than he performed in the Iowa caucus. There were starting to be talks at this time about whether or not Joe Biden should step away from the campaign, whether he should step out. Then on February 22nd, we see Nevada. Here, Biden has a more favorable showing, and he finishes second in the Democratic primary. Then on February 29th, we fast forward to South Carolina. Biden put all of his efforts, all of his money, what remained of it, into South Carolina. He relied on Jim Clyburn, the majority whip in the House at the time, and Jim Clyburn did Biden a solid favor. He really brought out African-American turnout in South Carolina. He endorsed Joe Biden, very much helping revive that campaign. In exchange, one of the things that was talked about at this time was Joe Biden making a pledge to Jim Clyburn and then in the debate following Clyburn's endorsement that he would nominate an African-American woman to the Supreme Court, recognizing the importance of diversity, particularly Afri African-American and gender diversity on the nation's highest court. <laughs> 
Biden succeeds and finishes first in this primary, reigniting his bid for the presidency. Then on March 3rd, we have Super Tuesday. Super Tuesday is, of course, the date that has most of the primaries um, on one day. Here, Biden prevailed in 11 of the 15 primaries on that day. I remember Super Tuesday well. I was doing interview after interview from my house at the time, but on radio stations and news networks all across the country, kind of watching the results come in and talking about how successful Biden was in each of these primaries. So again, we're seeing Super Tuesday, and on this day, Biden prevails in 11 of those 15 primaries. He's incredibly successful. His campaign is back on the rails. Things are going well. Now, just about this time, and even before this time, quite honestly, we were already starting to think about the pandemic, right? It was not called a pandemic just yet. That's going to come a couple days later. But even around Super Tuesday, there was talk with regards to what is the coronavirus? How is this going to impact the election moving forward? Well, Biden was in the right place at the right time. Having capitalized on Super Tuesday, he then moved into other primaries throughout the rest of that month and performed at that same high level, doing incredibly well um, as he concluded sort of the primary season, if you will. Now, of course, primaries kept going on, but Joe Biden now was the clear front runner, the clear favorite. When you have a Democratic primary or any presidential primary that has so many candidates, in this case, you know, 20 to 29 candidates, depending on how you're counting them, it's really hard to coordinate. And what South Carolina did on that February 29th date was really make it clear that if you wanted the moderate, if you wanted the centrist, if you wanted how it was pitched to people, the candidate most likely to defeat Donald Trump in the general election, you should be with Joe Biden. So as I said, Biden goes on to win every other primary contest, save the Northern Mariana Islands. The pandemic, right? As I said on the previous slide, or maybe I neglected to say due to the technical difficulties, um, we also saw that during this time, the WHO declares COVID-19 an actual pandemic on the 11th. So following up on some of those primaries that happened on March 10th where Biden was successful, now we have a clear pandemic on our hands. This probably helped Biden secure the remainder of those primaries. So the pandemic, which we're still living in this pandemic world, of course, is going to have massive effects on the election itself. One of the primary ways that it's going to affect the election is how people chose to vote. Do people choose to vote? Do people feel safe and comfortable turning out in an election where there's a pandemic going on? Given the pandemic, 29 states and the District of Columbia are going to enact over the course of the next couple of months, 79 different bills to expand voting access in 2020. Now, most all of this legislation was specific to 2020. So I wanna be very clear on that. This type, the legislation passed during this time would need to be um, repassed in most legislatures if it was going to persist in future elections. Most of this legislation did things like expand vote by mail options, expand polling place options, and also put in protections for poll workers or allow for different rules with regards to who qualifies to be a poll worker. More specifically, what most states did was increase access to early voting. Many states at this time only had what's called absentee voting. In absentee voting, there are many states that also made you have a reason for voting absentee. You had to prove that you would not be in this state. North Carolina was not one of these states, but many had these types of rules on the books. Many states got rid of these during the pandemic. Additionally, many states increased early voting. North Carolina increased early voting hours during the pandemic. Um, many states that did not have early voting prior added early voting hours during the pandemic. Additionally, longer windows in many states were allowed for mail-in ballots to arrive, both recognizing that the Postal Service might have trouble with the added um, responsibility of processing so many ballots, but also recognizing that we might need just more time in order to get things done. So some of these things, as I mentioned already, lessen the requirements to request an absentee ballot, allowing ballot drop boxes, which I did not mention, but this allowed people to return their absentee ballots or their mail-in ballots to different locations, not just having to mail it through the Postal Service. That was very helpful in many places. Some states use prepaid postage and or automatic requests to all voters, meaning that every voter across the state would receive a ballot, whether they requested one or not, making it very easy to simply fill out your ballot and return it. 
And then we changed the number of witnesses in some states. North Carolina was one of these states, which I'll talk about here in a moment. And then as I already discussed, those postmark deadlines changed in some places as well, whether your ballot had to be postmarked on election day or if there were extensions to that postmark deadline. Here in North Carolina, our state assembly did several things. So the first thing was allowing the state board of elections to reduce the number of witnesses required on an absentee ballot. And in typical election years, you need two signatures um, to your absentee ballot here in North Carolina. And for those of you who did vote by mail, on that very um, busy envelope that you had, there'd be two different lines for that witness to sign. Now, in this case, they reduced that to just one. So we had to go through a reprinting of new ballots, new envelopes, to just allow for that one witness signature. The idea here was to make it easier and simple for people to turn in their ballot. Also making it easier to request an absentee ballot. Typically that is more challenging for a variety of reasons, but more people had access to those absentee ballots. <clears throat> Another change that the North Carolina State Assembly made <clears throat> was allowing poll workers um, for election day and also early voting to come from outside the precinct. So typically a county such as Orange County here, where the University of North Carolina is located, there's no trouble fi finding people to work the polls. Now, other counties in different parts of the state might have more trouble. Now, given the state legislature said that people could come from outside precincts, this really helped um, find people who felt safe and comfortable working in those polls on election day and for early voting. Absentee and mail-in ballots also could now be received from 5 p.m. on November 12th, 2020, so long as they were postmarked on or before election day. This was also a change. In fact, if you fast forward to the Electoral College and the results that we saw on election night, I'm sure many of you were frustrated by why wasn't North Carolina being filled in, right? Why weren't they calling North Carolina for President Trump? Or maybe you were saying, I still hope that Joe Biden can win North Carolina. Well, the reality of why North Carolina was um, not being tallied at that time was very different from many of the other states. Most of the other states that were not being um, awarded their electoral college votes or were awarding their electoral college votes, I should say, were because they were still counting ballots. In the case of North Carolina, there was actually no counting going on. They were just waiting to get to that November 12th deadline when they would count the ballots and add that tally to what came in on election day. The last thing to note here is the State Board of Elections also on its own right expanded early voting sites um, here in 2020. They did one for every 20,000 registered voters across the state. So if you were able to early vote in 2020, um, lines were highly reduced um, across the state due to this um, change. The next thing I wanted to briefly talk about were presidential debates. So what I'll say about presidential debates in the political science literature is much lit literature suggests that they do very little, meaning they don't actually move public opinion all that much. So even after a debate, when people turn in, and even if when people say, oh, this candidate clearly won the debate, it's very unlikely that one person, the president or the challenger, or in the case of no incumbent president, that either person sees a significant bump in the polls. This remained true here in 2020. Now, the debates were unusual in that the first one um, was, to put it kindly, chaotic. And I think most people left with a bit of a disdain um, for the presidential debate itself. The second debate was then canceled for a variety of reasons, probably some of it due to that, but the story was due to COVID protocols. Of course, the president at this time had the coronavirus. He was not comfortable doing a remote debate, and so they just ended up canceling that second debate. There was, of course, a third debate. There was also the vice presidential debate. Now, again, these did not significantly change, so it seems, any voters' minds. Um, this does open up a question, what do we do with debates in the future? For those of you who did watch them, they certainly were different in a pandemic world. Um, is it worth reconsidering how we use debates, whether we even have debates going forward? That takes us to election day slash week. And here I want to focus on turnout, the results of the election, and the voter demographics that we know of. So first of all, 2020 voter turnout was record-breaking. I usually hate to use the word historic because it's overused, but in this case, it really was historic. So it was the highest voting percentage of eligible voters that we had seen since 1908. And keep in mind, in 1908, not everyone who's eligible to vote today was eligible to vote in 1908. So this is a major change. Um, 
and pretty significant when you look at it even over 2008, which prior to this election was the highest turnout since the 1960s. Um, so 66, 66.3% 66 of eligible voters turned out in the 2020 election. To give you even more of a comparative perspective, even though this is small on your screen, you can just see once again that all these different election years, this year really stands out as being significantly higher than many presidential elections in the past 20, 30, 40 years. That takes us to the actual results. So this electoral college map is the final electoral college map. But of course, we didn't know this result on election day, election night. Um, this is eventually how it plays out with President, current President Joe Biden receiving 306 electoral votes and former President Donald Trump receiving 232. But on election night, things looked a little bit different. These are the results as of 520 in the morning on November 4th. So we had Joe Biden at 224 and Donald Trump at 213. There were some significant states still left to be called. I already discussed North Carolina. That was not likely to be called anytime soon. We were waiting on those mail-in ballots that could be postmarked on election day and had until November 12th to arrive. We were waiting on Georgia, which was too close to call. Donald Trump had a slight lead at this time. We were waiting on Pennsylvania, which had actually just started counting its ballots on election day due to the law that the state legislature put in there saying that not a single mail-in ballot could be counted until the polls closed that night. So think of all the counting that still had to happen in that state going forward. We were waiting on Michigan and Wisconsin as well. Arizona had been called by some for Joe Biden. I think the AP had called it, but most places had not called Arizona yet. And of course, Nevada. Alaska would be called later, but just had not, all the votes had not been um, come in yet. So here again are the list of the key remaining states. Then on Saturday, November 7th, Biden wins Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, having many electoral college votes, secured him more than the 270 needed to win the electoral college. So who voted for each of the people in this election, right? This is a really interesting question, and it's one that political scientists often never find perfect answers to. The best answers that we can give rely on exit poll data, so who people say they voted for, and their basic demographics. Um, this is more or less what we can take away from who voted for President Trump, who did very well in the Electoral College, and did, quite frankly, very well in the popular vote. Again, we had incredibly high numbers of turnout. We saw more people turning out to vote for each of these candidates than we'd ever had seen in any presidential election in our nation's history, since 1908, I should say. So for um, President Trump, he clearly wins Republicans, people who self-identify as Republicans. He wins them by 88 percentage points. He clearly wins conservatives, those who identify as conservative. He wins people who say that their top issue going into this election was the economy or the top issue was crime. He very clearly wins white evangelical Christians, white people who have some college or less education. He wins Protestants or other Christians, non-evangelicals and also not Catholics, is important to note there. He wins whites, men and women, and he wins income of more than 100,000. He also wins men by eight percentage points. Joe Biden clearly wins some groups as well. He wins Democrats by one more point than Donald Trump won Republicans at 89 percentage points. He wins people who said that their top issue was either the coronavirus, the pandemic, or racial inequality. He wins liberals. He wins blacks. He wins non-white, some college or less. He wins non-college, um, non-white, excuse me, college grads. He wins the Hispanic or Latino vote, moderates, people who self-identify as moderates. He wins women. He wins young voters, and he wins college graduates. Now, interesting to note about some of these categories, right, whether I flip back and forth between the two slides, is that some of these groups are really small groups, right? So here I would center in on, let's use the age one, for instance. Joe Biden wins the age group 18 to 29 at plus 24%. That sounds great, but that's also the group that's the least likely to turn out, the least likely to cast a ballot. So it's not like these numbers are really all that comparable, comparative um, across different cases, unless you know how many people are in them. So we can dig a little bit deeper. The first thing I want to note is age and gender. So women did favor Biden, 57 to 42. Now, how much of the electorate they make up, they actually make up more than half of the electorate. 52% of the people who turned out here in 2020 were women. Men were more even in their voting. So 53% voted for Trump and 45% voted for Biden. 
18 to 29 year olds, which I mentioned earlier, broke for Biden 60 to 36. But again, that category of voter was only 17 percent of the electorate. All the other age categories have many more voters in them. Race. This one's pretty interesting. White voters favored Trump 58 to 41. And white voters in this country currently make up 67 percent of voters. Now, that's obviously more than the white population in the country. Non-whites favored Biden 71 to 26. That group makes up 33 percent of the voters, at least in the 2020 election. Here you can see blacks 87 to 12, Hispanic Latinos 65 to 32, and Asians 61 to 35. So clearly the black population, the African American population, still one of the most reliable voting blocks for the Democratic Party, which has been true since the 1960s in the passing of the Civil Rights Legislation and the Voting Rights Act. Race and sex, and I don't need to go through all of these um, explicitly, but you can see here from what's presented on your screen that white men favored Trump. Black men favored Biden, but to a lesser extent than black women. So if you recall again, Biden did well with women. Black women were an important part of his base. Now, of course, there are only 8% of voters, but black women really came out strongly for Joe Biden. Now, I'm not saying this is definitely causal, but again, go back to that endorsement from Jim Clyburn in the South Carolina primary and think about that debate promise that Biden made about putting an African-American woman on the Supreme Court. Maybe that was enough. It might not be enough, but it was something, right? And maybe that explains why black women were much more supportive of Joe Biden than black men. January 6. January 6 was an interesting day in American political history and will be as we move forward throughout the next several years, if not decades. So when we think about January 6, there's a lot that we can um, pull on with regards to where we go from here. And the things I want us to think the most clearly about and what I want to focus on here just for a moment are how do we bring our nation together? How do we overcome the fears that January 6 clearly indicated exist in the American public? How do we overcome the idea that an election might not be true, might not be real, the results might not be the truth, right? Where do we go from here? And I think a lot of this is going to rely and need not just Congress to act, not just Congress to think about what we can do with regards to voting legislation, but is going to rely on us as the American electorate, really to cross the lines, to come together, and figure out ways to move forward. Then on January 20th, I had this slide called Democracy Prevails, but then Joe Biden used, used the quote, Democracy Has Prevailed, so I switched it to that. Um, because on the heels of January 6th, there was some question about where we go, right? What, what is happening to our democratic processes? What is happening to our institutions? And January 20th and the transfer of power was such a nice reminder, especially on the heels of January 6th, that our institutions do persist. And so on January 20th, we see Joe Biden and Kamala Harris sworn in as president and vice president of the United States. And as I said, President Biden proclaims democracy has prevailed. So this was an important moment. This was an important moment, again, for American institutions. So even though President Trump was not present, Vice President Pence did his bidding for him. He welcomed the vice president and the president to the White House. He stood to watch you know, them come in. He got in the car along with his wife and left. All those transfers of power that we have been used to and accustomed to, they persisted. They withstood the test of time. They even withstood January 6th. So this was a very um, enlightening, I think, moment for American politics. So I want to switch really briefly before I get into kind of where we go from here and what's next to think a little bit specifically about the Georgia Senate elections. So simultaneously to all of the Electoral College stuff that was going on during election week, there was another big result in Georgia. I mean, of course, Georgia voting for Joe Biden over Donald Trump was sort of newsworthy in and of itself. But simultaneously, we had two Senate elections going on in the state. One was a special election, the election between um, Raphael Warnock and um, Kelly Loeffler, along with Doug Collins, also running as a Republican in that election. And then one was the standard Senate election between incumbent David Perdue and John Ossoff. And this election, or these elections, I should say, were incredibly close. So close, and we didn't know this on election night either, that both elections would end up going to a runoff. 
you can see in the standard um, Senate election that the Republican candidate, David Perdue, did slightly better than John Ossoff. And then you can see in the special election, um, mostly because it was a three-way race between two Republican candidates, Kelly Loeffler being the incumbent, um, Raphael Warnock did win a plurality of the votes, but not enough to um, not have a runoff. So you need 50% of the vote in Georgia in order to be proclaimed the winner and not go to a runoff election. So we end up on January 5th, the day, of course, before January 6th, um, with the Georgia runoffs um, in that state. And here, I think somewhat of a surprise to everyone, and we can talk about some of the reasons for this, we see um, David Perdue, the incumbent, lose to the Democrat candidate um, by a very close margin. And then we see in the special election, the Democrat also beat the incumbent, Kelly Loeffler. So we pick up two Democratic seats um, for that party in the United States Senate, which inter interestingly enough brings the total of senators in the United States Senate currently to a 50-50 tie. Now the idea there is with Vice President Kamala Harris in the White House as someone who can break a tie as Vice President in the United States Senate, the Senate is sort of seen as having a Democratic majority. Now of course, um, former Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and now Majority Leader Chuck Schumer have negotiated how that's going to play out, what that means for committees, et cetera, as we move forward. Um, but this result was somewhat surprising. I think in particular what's interesting to look at is the, the standard election, the one between Purdue and Ossoff, because if you recall in um, the regular election on election day, if I just flip back a slide, we saw Purdue ahead, right? He had 49.7. He almost got to that 50 percent where he would not have even needed a runoff election. And then he's going to go down um, and lose to Ossoff with the same percent, right? Ossoff just did, um, actually, I had those numbers reversed there. I'm sorry about that. Ossoff did win this election. Um, I have them listed incorrectly. Um, that is my mistake on the slide. Just reverse the names there with Ossoff on the top. So in this particular case, I think what's interesting to note is what were the differences between um, the general election, right, on November 3rd, and then this runoff election on January 5th. So what would have made the Republican candidate in this case perform less well? And there's a couple of sort of obvious answers, and of course there are other ones that we can discuss, but I think the first obvious answer is that the president wasn't on the ballot. And what this means, I think, going forward is really important for the Republican Party. Voters turned out for President Trump. And what that means, again, for that party going forward is how can the Republican Party capitalize on the enthusiasm, the mobilization that Donald Trump was able to do for the Republican Party. Something was missing when we fast forward to January 5th. The voters in the Republican Party were not as excited about turning out to vote for David Perdue without President Trump on the ballot. Another thing that's worth noting, of course, is that President Trump had been going around the country and had spent some time in Georgia talking about the fraudulent election, talking about the fact that we were not counting ballots correctly. That may have, in the minds of some people, suggested to voters that their votes don't count. Right? And so maybe that as well turns some voters off. So again, all this is to say that we need to think very clearly about our voting methods going forward, how we encourage people to turn out, how we trust in our institutions, how we make sure that our institutions are transparent, that our votes are transparent in such a way that people do believe in the process. So this sort of capitalizes or sums up what I had just said. Um, the runoff results do seem to indicate that Trump was helpful on the ballot in the general election. And this is not just a story, I should note, of the Georgia runoff, of the Georgia elections. This was a story that played out across the board, right? You could look at many of the polling numbers, and we can certainly talk about polls and all the mistakes that might have happened there. And you can see that in many states across the country that President Trump throughout you know, the primary season, throughout the general election campaign, was polling better in the states than senators or governors that were in statewide races, right? There was something about President Trump that voters in the party were more willing to support, more likely to get behind. And so that leads to a really important follow-up question, particularly for the Republican Party, is what does the Republican Party look like without Trump on the ballot, right? How do they move forward? Or how do they bring Trump, even without Trump, into the party, if that's the direction the party chooses to go? Okay, so this takes us to what's next. 
And here I want to think, like I said earlier, specifically about what's next for elections, what's next um, under a Biden administration, what's next for Congress, and then the two parties. And all of this I sort of hinted at already. Okay. So the first thing that I think is really important to think about are the voting methods that are going to come about now as a result of 2020, as a result of the pandemic in many ways. So the first thing I want to think about is how do states respond? What do they do? Do state legislatures decide to keep many of the voting laws that they put into place here in 2020, essentially opening up and making the opening up of the voting process more permanent, right? Or do they say things are going to return to normal, we'll go back to all of our old procedures? I think something the pandemic clearly showed is that when we do open up our voting processes, people do vote, right? Think back to those turnout numbers that I gave you. 66% of eligible voters turned out. Part of why they turned out might be that we made it easier than ever before for people to cast mail-in ballots, for people to drop ballots off at different sites, um, for people to engage with the early voting process, in some cases in states that never had utilized early voting before. So what do we do going forward? Do we continue to open up that process or do we go back to the old ways and try to find ways to make voting not necessarily hard, but you have to know the right way to vote. You have to know the right information in order to know when you have to register, where your polling place is, what precinct you're in, what the hours are, et cetera. So I think the first question is, will there be federal legislation? And I do think, regardless of your perspective on the voting methods that are used, it's really important to think about 2020 might have showcased a really, or made a really good case, I should say, for reasons to federalize or at least um, use the federal government to normalize some of the voting processes across the country. Again, when we go back to that electoral college map at 520 in the morning on November 4th, the fact that there were so many states that weren't called, some of them because they had laws that said you can't even start counting ballots, mail-in ballots, until after all polls closed, there was a lot of chaos. And that led to a lot of uncertainty about where are these votes coming from? Are these votes legitimate? Are these votes real? All the questions surrounding it. It'd be really nice if we had some type of consistent way to um, federalize the voting process in the country. Now, of course, the Constitution says that states control, um, control votes, control elections. Um, now, that being said, from time to time, Congress does step in, and they certainly have that constitutional right to do so. They did that back in 2000, following that presidential election with the Help America Vote Act. They certainly did that with the Voting Rights Act. And what we're likely to maybe see, especially now under a Biden administration, is sort of a reinstituting of the Voting Rights Act. So what has been proposed and was actually proposed in the last Congress um, as that Congress was on its way out um, in the House is the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, named for, of course, the former member of the House from the state of Georgia. And this Voting Rights Act, in many ways, reinstitutes some of the um, preclearance requirements is the big thing that were originally in the Voting Rights Act. Now, many of you recall that in Shelby County versus Holder, um, that Supreme Court decision several years ago, the Supreme Court stripped out certain parts of the Voting Rights Act. And one of those parts was the formula by which we determined what states needed to go through pre-clearance requirements, meaning that certain states that have proven over time um, to sometimes change voting laws in a way that might not be equally applied um, to all races, in those states, the Justice Department had to come in and approve any changes that were being made to those voting laws. What the John Lewis Voting Rights Act would do is essentially reinstitute those requirements with a new formula, an updated formula, which is the problem that the Supreme Court had with the old law. And using that updated formula, several states, six I believe, would sort of fall back under um, the, the need to use those preclearance requirements going forward. Another thing I think that some states might think long and hard about as we move forward are runoff elections. So keep in mind that in the Georgia Senate elections, had there not been a runoff, um, we would have seen one Republican elected on election day and one Democrat elected on election day. Now, it's not always the fact that that one election is so consequential that it determines control of the United States Senate, but in this case, it would have. 
right? In this case, it would have meant the continuation of a Republican majority in the United States Senate. Now, this matters. Of course, not all states use runoffs, but if we think about state legislatures throughout the country, 33 of them are currently controlled by the Republican Party. So if the Republican Party is looking at this and saying, why are we instituting runoffs? Is this something we want to continue to do? Or maybe the Democratic Party also saying something similarly in different places, you might see some states that institute changes with regards to the necessity of runoff elections moving forward. Primaries are another place that I think we might see some changes to elections moving forward. I mentioned the fiascos that happened around the Iowa caucus already, um, and I think there's two questions here that we can expect to not see on the, on the agenda just yet, but particularly as we get closer um, to the 2024 presidential election, which always comes faster than one might think or one might want, um, we might start to hear some grumblings about how can Iowa at least improve on its poor, poor, poor um, performance back in um, January, and what can be done, and is it even worth questioning whether Iowa still should go first in the primary season. Now, this is often a question that, of course, is asked, you know, why always Iowa and New Hampshire? And it's just one of those agreements that the states have come up with, along with the parties, and it is the way it is. Um, you may also recall that states have tried to play with this from time to time and have been penalized by the parties for it. Um, examples of Michigan and Florida in previous elections come to mind in those cases. Um, so it's not something that individual states can do. It would be the party making a decision. And maybe the party wants to make a decision that would change some of the emphasis of cer certain states, excuse me, on um, who goes first and what those states or who those states are. In particular, I'm thinking about Joe Biden's poor performance in many of the first states. So what kind of candidate does a party want to emerge in a general election? It became pretty clear early, not early on in the Democratic primary, but there in March when Joe Biden started to do so well, that he was the rallying point when Democrats decided we need someone who's more moderate, right? We need someone who maybe can beat Donald Trump, even though we might like the more socially progressive policies of these other candidates, or we might like more of an emphasis on consumer spending, or we might like more of an emphasis on pick your favorite progressive um, area of policies. Um, but Joe Biden became the kind of clear coordinating candidate around the moderate faction of the party, which still in a general election maintains itself as being a pretty big faction of that party. So do the parties consider rejiggering any of their primaries, I think is a good question. Additionally, who is eligible? We now have seen in 2020 um, a myriad of Democrats want, um, running in the primary. Now, going back to 2016, we saw the same thing on the Republican side, which of course led to Donald Trump being nominated. And so do parties start to reconsider this, right? At the end of the day, the party controls its brand. And if the party at any time wants to somehow say, these are the requirements in order to run in our primary, you're welcome to run as an independent, you're welcome to run somewhere else, um, do parties start to take that conversation more seriously? And I think they might, right, on the heels of just having so many candidates, which really makes the coordination around a can um, one candidate problematic. The debates, right? And so let's say we do allow any candidate who wants to run, run within a party's primary. Do they change eligibility, at least for the debates, right? To winnow down that field somewhat and not have a stage full of 20 different people, which really makes it hard and challenging to hear from any one person. And then, as I already mentioned, also the role of presidential debates, right? Do we change that at all, especially you know, on the heels of a pandemic world where we might now realize the lack of utility even in a debate? The Electoral College, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about whether or not the Electoral College will continue and persist as we move forward. Um, it's always a topic of conversation. I think this year the Electoral College was a resounding success, right? And I say that in, in recognizing all the problems that resulted even from the Electoral College, not knowing on election night, um, we had the results being questioned in different states, what would they do? We had the issues on January 6th. But that being said, I really believe had we gone with just a simple popular vote, we might have seen every single state, all 50 states, had their election returns questioned, as opposed to just the targeted 
questions of the states that were not known on election night, as opposed to the lawsuits that just happened in those states. Imagine a world where we're counting every single ballot across all 50 states. I think the Electoral College really shone through. We ended not having any um, electors who went rogue, who voted for a different person. Um, we can talk about the certification of those results in Congress, of course, on January 6th slash 7th. Um, and that was a different process, most certainly, than it has been in years past. But at the end of the day, the election was certified by the House of Representatives, um, by the Senate, a joint session. And the Electoral College, I think, was incredibly successful. Now, for people who don't like the Electoral College, it's usually when the popular vote does not match the Electoral College. Now, in this case, this year, that also played out in such a way that that was not a concern. Um, I do always ask people who do want to get rid of the Electoral College, what are good alternatives, right? I really think that's an important thing to consider as someone who studies institutions. If not the Electoral College, then what, right? And what are the consequences? So one could imagine a world where we do go to the popular vote. And of course, there are you know, good reasons why that might be preferable. But at the same time, then our presidential campaigns end up much more focused on urban issues, right? Um, presidential candidates exclusively go to New York City, Los Angeles, Houston, Chicago, Dallas. Um, and there's nothing wrong, of course, with campaigning in those places. But those issues exclude a large section, a large swath of America. And one might say right now that we put too much emphasis on rural America through the Electoral College, and that is certainly a fair critique of the Electoral College. But there are not necessarily clear alternatives that are always, quote unquote, better alternatives. Another thing I think we'll see um, moving forward with regards to election are changes in social media, tech, corporations. Um, one of the things that I would think was interesting on the heels of January 6th, to go back to that slide, is we saw a lot of corporations decide to pull funding, to pull campaign funds um, from either particular candidates or um, just universally from political campaigns. Um, funding might be what gets some candidates, some members of Congress to start paying attention. So what is the story there? What happens as we approach elections moving forward? Money more broadly. Um, also the question of social media and censorship, um, the questions of free speech on social media. We of course have seen some Twitter accounts come down, including the president's, Facebook accounts being closed. I think that's gonna be a real conversation here going forward. Um, and then last, I would be remiss if I didn't mention polling. And perhaps someone will ask a question about polling. Um, but just like 2016, many of the national polls and state polls were off in this election cycle. And in fact, many of the, they are off by almost the same margins as they were in 2016, um, despite the fact that so many of our polling um, consultants and agencies really tried to update those polls. Um, some of the reasons for that, I think, are kind of clear. The first one being high turnout, right? It was hard to predict how much higher um, turnout would be. And the question then is like, who are those new voters? Um, and if you're not tapping into them because all of our polling models are based on previous elections, that might be problematic. Additionally, who was mobilized? I think this is an interesting point. Um, the time that a lot of the polls were happening, whether through summer or into the fall, was a big mobilization period, particularly for progressive Democrats. And so if progressive Democrats are being polled, if they're um, you know, talking about turning out and being a part of Black Lives Matter and a movement and change, um, but then as you get into November, they don't turn out, that could have been an effect um, of some of the polling. The pandemic as well. Um, who was more likely to go out and vote during the pandemic versus not? Um, I think there were some real questions around that and that might have led to some of the, the polling issues as well. Um, particularly if Democrats felt more, um, more like, or were more likely to stay at home and wear their mask and not go out in public and adhere to social distancing, it might have been more likely that they were polled, right? That they answered the phone call when the polling agency called them, thereby upping the numbers um, for Democrats in those polls. And then also just Trump respondents, right? There was always this theory starting in 2016 floating around out there that there were shy Trump voters that would not want to tell someone, an interviewer, that they were voting for Trump. I don't think that was really the case here in 2020, but I do want to mention it um, just in case, you know, it's part of our conversation later. Okay, so moving forward, um, just kind of concluding here on some of these slides so we can get to some questions. The president. The president, Joe Biden, has set a, a pretty, um, 
ambitious agenda before him. And for those of you who I'm sure are paying attention at home, he's kind of been going through each day, having sort of a signature topic area, signing executive orders in that area. Um, he has a lot of work to do on COVID relief. He's trying to get a large package again here through Congress. February, March is a timeline for that. He, of course, is focused on the economy. He's done some work already on immigration, has a big plan there as well. I already mentioned the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. I think that's at the top of his agenda. Racial justice, yesterday was his executive order signing day on racial justice initiatives. There's more work to be done there. All this is to say, um, presidents can do a lot, but most of this, the actual legislating, of course, falls on Congress. So what is Congress going to do? And in Congress, the margins are tight, right? So when we think about having a Democratic president um, and having unified government, which is something we have not seen um, for the Democratic Party since Barack Obama was in office his first two years, there's a lot to attempt to get done um, for that political party. So in the House, for instance, the Democrats did retain their majority, but it was not really seen as a great election night for them. Um, most, again, polls, <laughs> um, what you'll put in those is up to you, had indicated that how the House would, would pick up, the Democrats would pick up seats in the House. And in fact, they lost seats in the House. Um, they performed way below expectations. So there's a very slim majority that the president has to work with in the House. And I already mentioned the Senate, where there's essentially no majority, right? Um, it is a 50-50 tie, and of course you do have the vice president's tie-breaking vote. But all that is to say, to go through President Biden's agenda and to get things done and check them off the list is going to be incredibly challenging. And keep in mind, particularly in the House, um, you have a party that is not necessarily, um, is not necessarily cohesive. Right? Um, so there are many factions within the Democratic Party at the moment, and how does that play out will be something that's worth watching. So I want to go back to the Democrats performing below expectations as a party. Some of this, of course, was polling, which I, I already sort of hinted at. Um, but there is a lot of data out there to suggest that a big part of this was the Democratic parties, and it's not so much the party itself, um, but the conversation around the party, its focus on extremely progressive policies, right? And I use defund the police as an example, um, an example that was actually brought to the Democratic caucus meeting shortly after the election, where a representative from Virginia, a moderate representative from Virginia, Abigail Spamberger, you know, specifically mentioned defund the police as a problem um, to her ability to win her moderate district, which she did win. She was victorious notorious, but it was really close. And she was sort of saying that this is a part of our party's problem. Now, I would like to note, it's not like the Democratic Party itself was running national campaign ads on progressive agenda items or on defunding the police, but the Republican Party in particular was. Right? And they were spending a lot of time um, taking what might be moderate Democrats or even conservative Democrats and throwing campaign ads at them that were tying them to these types of policies, such as defund the police or a Green New Deal, things like that. And I think this also plays out because we can see and look at the data that shows that the Democrats that did lose um, lost mostly in um, rural or suburban districts, right? So not the urban districts, not the, the heart of, if you will, the Democratic Party. Um, and maybe some of this was also COVID related. That's hard to say and parse out. But the Democrats clearly have some work to be done here. Republicans continue this trend in this election of electing inexperienced candidates. And I'll have a couple slides on this here in a moment. Um, but before I do that, I do want to note that Democrats are also electing inexperienced candidates. And what I mean by that specifically are candidates who are running for federal government, the United States Congress, at the Senate or the House level, who have never held previous elective office. They did not serve in the state legislature. They did not serve as a mayor, even of Carborough or Chapel Hill. They don't have that type of experience. They've never run an election before. Um, and it's not so much the election that's important. That's important for campaigning, to know how to fundraise, to have um, your Rolodex full of names to call, to have name recognition. But they also might not know how to legislate. So I think, I think that's an interesting point here. And I'll, I'll pick up on that here in one moment. Um, and then the, the point here for Republicans about Trump doing better than many Senate candidates, which I've already made before, I think is worth paying attention to. So just in this election, 2020, right? talking about the number of inexperienced Republicans who won. Um, we had Tommy Tuberville win a seat in the United States Senate. He's probably most famous for being um, the coach of the Auburn Tigers, the football team in Alabama. 
We have Lauren Bobart from Colorado, who um, is probably most famous now for owning a restaurant in Rifle, Colorado called Shooters, which she refused to close during the pandemic, even after a state um, lockdown, right? Um, so they gave her a cease and desist order. They took away her food license. Um, she allows open carry in her restaurant. Um, never had held previous office. We have Marjorie Taylor Greene in Georgia. Um, this is actually a picture of her from the first day that she was sworn in um, to the United States Congress. And she is a believer in the QAnon theories. We have Andrew Clyde, also from Georgia, um, representing the district around Athens, Georgia, where the University of um, Georgia is. And he owns um, ammunition shops in, in Georgia, has never held elective office before. And then here in our own backyard in North Carolina, we have Madison Cawthorn, um, who is also, he's now the youngest person uh, elected in recent contemporary times um, to Congress at age 25, um, but also no previous elective office experience. Again, I do want to note that this is also a trend that's happening in the Democratic Party. Though something that's different in the Democratic Party, and I think speaks to that fissure that I've sort of alluded to a few times between the more progressive wing of the Democratic Party and the more moderate wing of the Democratic Party, is the Democrats who are running that don't have elective experience are actually taking out pretty well-established um, centrist incumbents, right? And we certainly saw this back when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez won, taking out the chairman of the um, caucus, Joseph Crowley, a few years ago. And then in this election, we see Cori Bush um, in Missouri. She ends up defeating Lacey Clay, Jr., who's, you know, the Clay family had been um, holding the Missouri first seat for a very long time. Cori Bush really got her street cred on the streets of Ferguson, Missouri. She marched there um, after Michael Brown was killed. Um, she was a big um, part of the Black Lives Matter movement. And she defeats Lacey Clay. And her point was that he's not doing enough, right, especially on racial justice issues. Fair enough, right? Now, Lacey Clay, for those who have been paying attention to congressional politics for the last several decades, founded the Congressional Black Caucus, right? And that's not to say that we don't need new blood, but there is a difference here between the types of candidates that are running and winning as inexperienced candidates on the Republican side versus the Democrat side. Same thing with Jamal Bowman um, in New York. He um, left his job as a middle school principal in the Bronx to run for office, defeating Elliot Engel um, in the primary, who had held his seat for many years. He was the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, had a lot of experience in Congress as well. And both of these members are now officially part of the squad in Congress. Um, so just to show you again, and this is both political parties, this is the success of inexperienced candidates, right? Those ones without previous experience in elective office. Um, from 1980 here all the way to 2020. And this is the percent of the primaries, the percent being the, the number along the Y axis there, the 20 to 45. Um, the percent of primaries won by an inexperienced candidate. And I'm kind of playing with the data a little bit here because these primaries are only including primaries where an experienced candidate was also running. So they had to defeat someone who had more experience in order to be classified here. And then the numbers that you see are just the raw numbers, right? So for instance, in 2020, 104 inexperienced candidates won their primary. Now that doesn't mean that they went on to win the general election in every case, though I did show you the photos of many who did. Um, but a lot of people are, are running this way and it seems to have traction with the electorate, which is a part of my research agenda and something I, I'm very interested in. Very quickly, because I, I do want to get to questions, um, the 117th Congress, so beyond elections, things to pay attention to. Um, the share of power in the Senate, right? We just this week came up with a deal between McConnell and Schumer um, on moving forward and how to organize the Senate. Um, and McConnell agreed to this even without Schumer agreeing to not get rid of the filibuster. So what does happen to the filibuster, I think is a question um, worth considering and something I'd be more than happy to talk about in the Q&A. As I mentioned, there's a slim majority in the House for the Democratic Party. Um, something we do see is more women, once again, um, than ever before in the United States Congress. So now women do make up more than a quarter of the membership of the United States Congress. I should note here that that's one of the benefits of inexperienced candidates running for political office is Congress has become more diverse. So a big part of inexperienced candidates is they do bring diversity to Congress. And that probably is a good thing, but there might be other consequences of that lack of experience as as we move through the legislative process. Another thing to think about, of course, is impeachment. Um, 
Of course, President Trump was impeached for a second time by the House. Those articles have been sent over to the Senate. Um, conviction seems unlikely, particularly on the heels of a vote that occurred just yesterday um, on whether or not the trial itself was constitutional, with the question being since the president is no longer in office. Um, and most Republicans saying no, including um, Mitch McConnell, that it's not constitutional, which is probably a precursor for how that will vote, um, how that vote will go. And so I, I sort of expect that when the trial proceeds, Democrats try to move it forward as quickly as possible to get to Joe Biden's agenda. Um, because any time that you're you know, taking up with the trial and a potential conviction is taking away from the first 100 days, is taking away from helping get um, vaccines to people, et cetera. So the parties. Um, my question for the parties, uh, my kind of final take here, is how do Democrats win in rural America? and not just among whites. Um, this is important. And the point about not just among whites means how do they win rural minority voters as well? Um, this is gonna be an important part of the Democratic base. Democrats cannot win just with urban voters and college town voters. They need to find a way to connect with other places in America. And then how do Republicans win without Trump? How do they choose to, if they choose to, rebrand their party? Um, some place that I'd like to kind of focus on very briefly here um, is Robinson County here in North Carolina, because I think it's a, a good example both for the Democrats, what has not gone so well for that party and what the party needs to improve upon, and for the Republican Party, what has gone well and what their strategy is. So Democrats really underperformed, as I already said, in rural and suburban districts here in 2020. Um, and a big part of that is reconciling the progressive left and the progressive left being the part of the Democratic Party that seems to get the most attention, right? And so if you think about Democrats and if you think about you know, who, the, who the faces are that come to mind or you think about the policies that come to mind, what tends to come to mind for many voters are the more progressive policies, right? Or are the faces of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or are the faces of Bernie Sanders or Nancy Pelosi even. Now, part of that, again, is an effort made by the Republican Party, which is a very smart strategic political maneuver. Um, but part of it is also that that's the loud part of the party, right? And so how can you reclaim, as a Democrat, part of the middle ground? Now, some people might say you shouldn't. You should just let it go. It's going to be hard to win elections, though, without rural America. So what do we do? My suggestion to the Democratic Party would be to make national policies local, right? So instead of just talking about um, climate change, which sounds you know, really nice in theory, but a voter might say, and how does that affect me, make it about jobs that are going to be helpful to reducing emissions or about new types of clean energy that will bring jobs back to the district, those kinds of things. And this is where Robinson County is really useful. So Robinson County is one of the poorest counties in North Carolina. It's one of the least educated counties of the 100. It's a highly diverse county. Um, it has a huge Lumbee Native American population. It has a small white population and about an equal percent black population. Um, and this county, um, Robinson, was won by the Republicans. So the Republicans, for a long time, very Democratic county. Um, Donald Trump won this county by more than he did in 2016. And 2016 was the first year the Republicans had been victorious in this county. Um, and so what did Trump do, right? And what could um, Democrats learn from what Trump did? Well, the first thing Trump did is he campaigned there, right? And now part of this is pandemic problems, right? The Democratic Party took more seriously its efforts with regards to the pandemic, its social distancing, it's not campaigning, it's doing things virtual. President Trump did not, but that did allow him a stage. And Donald Trump loved the stage, and he took his stage all across America. He didn't just set up a stage in New York City, in Chicago, going back to our electoral co um, college conversation. He would take his stage anywhere to where there were people who would applaud for him. And he took it to Robinson County. He also said that he would recognize the Lumbee um, tribe, which has always been a matter of great importance in Robinson County, um, dating all the way back to former Congressman Mike McIntyre, a Democrat from that area. He worked very hard on legislation in this area. Um, he acknowledged that the Lumbee should be recognized. Now, legislation was in Congress, in the last Congress, on this issue. It did not pass. It failed in the Senate. I'm happy to talk more about that. Maybe it will come up again. Um, but Trump acknowledged that. Joe Biden did as well. I should note that. Um, but this was, this was an important moment that he emphasized um, in his campaign.
He also really did a nice job of playing up, um, and not just in Robinson County, but in other places, social, social and cultural conservatism. So this is an important part of rural America, is the belief in life, is the belief in a right to own a gun, um, is an anti-NAFTA, which of course used to be a, a Republican position, um, NAFTA itself. Um, it, it's these kinds of issues, though, and the fact that you'll hear when you go to rural America, people tell you that they're voting for a president, not a pastor, right? But they're voting for someone that they believe is standing up for the things that they are taught are culturally and socially important. And this is something the Democratic Party seems to be missing currently as a party. There are certainly individuals that are doing this. Um, but how does the Democratic Party reach culturally conservative people in a way that the Republican Party has been very successful at doing going forward? All right. So both parties have work to do. Um, we're going to have to watch for changes in voting methods here in 2021 and as we move forward. And then we need to think about our policies for both parties. And for the Democratic Party in particular, making some of those national policies, whether it be immigration or climate change um, or racial justice, make them local. Make them apply to local rural communities so they understand why these things are priorities as opposed to something like jobs. Um, and I think it'll be really interesting to watch this all unfold. I look forward to all your questions. Thank you for listening to me ramble. Um, thank you for being here. If that was rambling, that was the most direct, straightforward rambling I ever heard. Um, there is a chorus of, uh, you can hear it right now if you just listen closely, of applause. Thank you so much thank for you. that, Dr. Sarah Trull. Uh, wonderful. Uh, we do have some questions. I just want to make one observation. If there are inexperienced and younger, younger candidates, they will have no idea what a Rolodex is. <laughs> but uh, <Sure>. be, <laughs> let me go sure. to a few of our questions. So this one is from Niels Brubaker. It's actually two questions based on some of those exit polls that you had mm -hmm. showed earlier. Yeah. And just basically, are these percentages based on exit polls and how accurate are they? The source of the information and its accuracy. Yeah, absolutely. So these are all Washington Post exit polls. And that's a great question. And exit polls are never 100% accurate, right? Um, just like any polling, we're relying on voters to truthfully report um, what they did and who they are. Um, and exit polling is just like, again, the other polling leading up to the election do have larger margins of error, exit polls more so than others. Um, exit polls are often done by someone giving you an iPad on your way out the door from voting. Theoretically, it should be the easiest recall you've ever had. Who did you just vote for? Um, but not everyone feels comfortable um, relying that inf relaying that information um, to the person doing the interviewing. So do take all of those numbers with a little bit, you know, a grain of salt here and there. Um, but you can kind of safely subtract plus or five, which is why I only put the biggest categories up there, right? So where these candidates did really well with a certain group of people, um, it's likely that that was a solid voting block. Um, I just have a brief follow-up to that question. Mm -hmm. Are there are there any studies of trends that can be seen in the types of answers that people give? So if you know people will tend to be you know uh, lie about this to a certain percentage. <laughs> Yeah, they, there's a little bit of research on that, not directly on exit polls. Um, there is some in like national political polls and survey data that's out there. Um, nothing has been found that's super consistent across time. Great, thank you for that. We have a question here from Tom Zitlow. It is, can we split out the effect of new ways to vote versus Trump on the ballot to explain the high turnout? Is this higher turnout durable, in other words? Yeah, um, that's hard, right? That's um, statistically a challenge, and I think something that's very much unknown as we move forward. Once we have an election without Trump, it will be easier um, to answer that question. Of course, there's always a drop-off in turnout, and I would expect a particular large drop-out in turn off, uh, turnout Excuse me, here in 2022, so the first midterm election, um, which always, again, sees lower turnout than a general election with a president on the ticket. Um, 2022 will probably be even lower than we're used to, um, given the fact that it was so high, right? The, the distance will just be um, greater between turnout and the general election here in 2020 versus 2022. But it will help us start to get a sense of what Trump did on the ballot when we could hold constant some of the states that had a Senate election here in 2020 and states that will have a Senate election coming up in you know 2022. Great, thank you for that. We have a question here from Sharon Levitt. Uh, discuss the role of voter ID laws and how there could be 50 different versions of voter ID in the future. Yeah, absolutely there could be. Um, again, the Constitution leaves voting legislation up to the states, right? 
Um, and this means that states can put into effect their own voting laws, and this includes voter identification. Um, many states already have voter ID laws in place, and they do. They run the gamut from showing a photo identification to just showing your name. One of the struggles here, which is not particularly voter ID in 2020, was some states require a signature match, right, from your driver's license to your mail-in ballot. Um, that's incredibly challenging, particularly in this world of electronic signatures that are so highly utilized. Um, you know, someone in my generation or older might have a consistent signature. I don't know if any of you have had the experience of trying to work with a 15-year-old on a signature. It's completely different every time, right? So the idea of signature matching, something that person put on a driver's license at age 16 versus how they're now signing their ballot at age 22, um, it's really easy to throw out ballots. And, and this is where, again, um, states that have these kinds of laws, I think are going to have to do some work um, on updating them or thinking them through a little bit further as these kinds of issues came to light in 2020. Um, and that's not to necessarily answer your direct question about voter identification, um, but it will be interesting kind of the, I don't want to call it a, a challenge, but there will be a struggle somewhat between two camps that are going to want to open up the voting process here after 2020 and some that are going to want to lock it down even more. And um, given you know, where the two parties tend to fall on this issue and given the fact that most state legislatures right now are controlled by the Republican Party, I think we're more likely to see a reining in of a lot of the uh, more open processes we just you know, used in 2020, but only time will tell. And you know, maybe voters will um, be unhappy about that. And, and that could actually have some effect too in the future. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, uh, you might have predicted, you had a little bit of pushback on the Electoral College. Absolutely. So here we go from none other than our uh, esteemed colleague Lloyd Kramer. And it's, it's kind of long, so bear with me. Okay. Uh, how can the Electoral College be considered a success when Biden would have lost the election despite a popular vote victory of over 7 million votes if only 50,000 votes had been different in three states? Also, the abolition of the Electoral College would actually make all states more important. All but 10 states are now basically ignored. Without the Electoral College, blue votes would matter in Alabama and red votes would matter in California, etc. Isn't the Electoral College a deep threat to the stability of democracy? It's a great question, Lloyd. Thank you for it. And I think um, my best answer might be we should go have a cup of coffee sometime. Um, there's a lot there, right? And you make excellent points. And these are all the correct points to make if one was to um, desire getting rid of the Electoral College. Now, that being said, my easiest comeback to the first part of your point, which is, you know, it only was a few votes here and there that separated Joe Biden from losing the Electoral College um, and still winning the popular vote by a pretty large margin. My response is he didn't. He didn't lose, right? He won the Electoral College. And yes, elections are close. Um, elections are particularly close in these polarized times. Um, we really do seem to be a 50-50 nation in the eyes of not just us and our electorate, but of course the broader um, world as well. And um, it was close. It was close in many places. And um, a fact I like to give here to your point about California is um, Donald Trump um, received more votes in California um, than, than any other you know, state, right? And of course, that's because it's the largest state, um, but there's Republicans in California too. And so there is a benefit, as you're noting, to getting rid of the Electoral College to have each of those votes feel like they, they count in some way, shape, or form in the vote for president. Um, now, that being said, I, I do think it's not completely correct to say that different states, like all states would matter, and today only the 10 battleground states matter. I really think what we would start to see is the populous states matter, right? And not even the states, the cities, and that's what I was trying to emphasize. Um, you can go to New York and pick up 8 million votes right there. You spend a lot of time in New York. You spend a lot of time in Chicago. You spend a lot of time in LA, Houston, Dallas, Miami. Um, those are the places that get the attention. And so you're right, it's a trade-off. Are, are we more okay with with candidates spending t you know, time in 10 states, right, in the world where candidates used to all travel, um, or are we more okay with candidates spending time in 10 cities? Um, I don't think there's a, a right or wrong answer to that question, but those are the kinds of trade-offs that I think we have to weigh when we think about the utility of the Electoral College moving forward. Great, thank you for that. And I think Lloyd will take you up on the cup of coffee. Fantastic. We'll do that anytime. I'll, I'll just put that out there. Uh, Rob David has a question about uh, uh, our vice president. Did Harris have an identifiable impact on election results? Yeah, so I, I think, again, I mentioned um, 
I mentioned Jim Clyburn's endorsement of Joe Biden shortly before the South Carolina primary. I mentioned one of the things that Jim Clyburn really did push Joe Biden on was um, vocalizing support for an African-American woman on the Supreme Court, which he did in the debate. Um, and I, I think, you know, it, it's hard to, of course, completely parse, you know, that endorsement out from picking um, Kamala Harris as his running mate. Um, but I think the same kind of um, voter support for the African-American woman on the Supreme Court would definitely be there for Kamala Harris as the first female vice president on the ticket. So I would imagine, you know, same kind of voting block that you're tapping into, but did it mobilize a few more people? Did it get more people excited? My answer and intuition is yes, but we haven't been able to actually like parse the data out to know if that is actually true. Great, thank you. We have a question here from Diane. Uh, please talk more about the filibuster in the Senate. What is the significant difference it makes? Hmm. Yeah, so as a scholar of the United States Congress, I've long been a believer in the filibuster um, for its sort of institutional, historical um, impact. And the idea, again, that the Senate itself was des not designed to slow legislation down. The Senate was designed um, to allow minority opinions to be heard. And of course, not minority in the diverse sense, but minority in the unpopular sense. Um, and that's really what the Senate was for a very long time. And I would also say senators took that very seriously. And an important part of that was the filibuster, the right for everyone to be heard, um, to make a point that some person, one person in the United States Senate was more or less an equal to the majority leader in the Senate. And they could hold the floor and they could talk about whatever they wanted to for as long as they wanted to, resulting in the filibuster. That being said, the filibuster has been abused, especially in recent history. Um, and we have more recently seen both Majority Leader Reid, Democrat, and Majority Leader McConnell, Republican, um, take away parts of the filibuster, right? First, Reid took away the filibuster um, for court nominations, save the Supreme Court, and then McConnell doubled down and took away the filibuster for Supreme Court nominations just a few years ago. And so that leaves us with the filibuster today just on legislation. And I shouldn't say just, because obviously legislation is highly important. Um, but that being said, it does raise a question of what is the utility? And particularly for the Democratic Party, a party that, um, for the reasons that Lloyd was somewhat just talking about with regards to the Electoral College, and I talked about in my remarks, um, is not super popular across rural America at the moment. Uh, when you think about the Senate, rural America is overrepresented, which means that Republicans, as the current party that adheres more clearly to um, the wishes of a rural constituency, is overrepresented in the Senate which related to the filibuster means that the Republican Party um, is likely to always have an, a large number of senators in it. It's going to be very hard for the Democratic Party to ever have, the, I mean, it, it did happen not too long ago, but the numbers quickly shifted down to have 66, 67 senators um, elected to the United States Senate. So if you are a Democrat, and right now with a small Democratic majority such that it is, um, this is a potential opportunity to do away with something that is likely an impediment to your legislative agenda. Um, typically, this has not been considered um, you know, something that either party wants to do, because both parties are good at looking you know, down the game tree into the future and saying, well, someday I might be in the minority again. You know, We should definitely keep the filibuster there. And that's sort of what has held the filibuster in place. Now, in this particular instance, though, we have the Democratic Party, for the reasons I just noted, unlikely to ever get enough seats as currently constructed to reach that supermajority threshold um, where, they, where they have 66 or 67 votes. Republicans are more likely to have that. And additionally, right now, the Democrats have a large legislative agenda. They have a lot of things that they proactively want to do. If they got rid of the filibuster, they could much more easily do them. They would not need to rely on Republicans. Um, I think this is probably beneficial to that party, the Democratic Party at the moment, um, and probably worth it in the long haul for the reasons I already stated. But the Democratic Party with this agenda is different from the Republican Party, who currently in the Senate, in the last several years in the Senate, has not had a clear agenda, has just had a, a no, like a stop. We don't want to see change. 
But again, for a party like the Democratic Party right now that has so much it wants to do, I, I think it very seriously is considering getting rid of the filibuster. And my expectation would be that it does just that. Great thing. I, th I understand Kristen Cinema might be against it. Uh, so they have some members of their own caucus that they need to convince them. They that. do have members of their own caucus that they're going to have to convince because it is still it would still be a majority vote to get rid of the filibuster. And we already talked about those numbers um, not being particularly favorable to either party at the moment. Great. Thank you for that. We have a question here from Joe Rytok. Hello, Joe. Uh, what voter suppression efforts do you see in the next two years? <laughs> um, well, again, I think this was a very successful election um, on the anti-suppression front. So I, I feel very encouraged by that. I also feel very encouraged um, from the John Lewis legislation that might be going through Congress as a way to, again, open up the process and get more people to turn out. I do think, going back to the earlier question that addressed voter ID, I think that is a question that's not going away. I think state legislatures will continue to pursue that. Um, I also think tactics such as what we saw President Trump um, trying to utilize in the fall about you know votes not counting, votes not being valid, can turn people off. Um, and if used in the right places at the right times, can have a suppression effect. So I, I don't know the specifics of you know what what parties or what candidates or what people are going to do, um, but you know elections are about turnout and mobilization. And if there's any way to make sure that your people turn out and the others don't, um, I wouldn't put it past some politicians. I know you work with numbers. Here's a numbers question for you from Julia Barton. How many hours a week do members of Congress spend fundraising versus legislating? That's a fabulous question, um, and it's not a pretty answer. So by all accounts, when I speak to members of Congress now and hear about their daily schedules, many members are tasked with fundraising about eight hours a day. Um, and that means fundraising not just for themselves, but it's fundraising for the party. Um, they call it call time, the amount of time that you're supposed to be on the phone with, I won't use Rolodex, your, their iPhone, um, <laughs> where they keep their contacts and where the party gives them contacts, the people that they need to call and make sure to connect with. Um, I'm sure not everyone does eight hours a day, but that is more or less the standard by which both parties have put forward to um, their members. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it certainly makes us think a little bit about campaign finance reform. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, yeah. Probably a necessary one, but um, a big one and, and a tough um, road to hole. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, we have, um, we're out of questions from the audience. I have one just small question, if you'll humor me. Um, I'm just curious about Trump's actions after the election and whether that had any effect on people who voted for him during the election that might have soured folks. You talked about turnout in Georgia being largely because um, he wasn't on the ticket. But it seems like very few people that voted for Trump seemed very upset with his behavior after. So, I mean, it depends what part of his behavior you're, you're speaking about. I mean, I think, um, I think there were a lot of his voters that were disappointed that um, with the rhetoric that he used around the Georgia runoff is the first part of this. Mm -hmm. So immediately following the election, the fact that he kept saying that the election was rigged or he was the winner or votes weren't being counted or we were making up votes, whatever kind of language he was using, particularly around Georgia, which had these two important runoffs coming up, um, there were, I, I, I mean, I, I have to believe this, people that were unhappy about that within the Republican Party. Um, and then as far as his rhetoric around January 6th, um, I think this goes both ways. I think this shows, again, the fissure that's in the Republican Party, similar to the one that I spoke of at length about the Democratic Party. Um, there is a, a block of Republican voters that are Trump voters and are Trump loyalists. And I, I think they're true believers in, in you know, what he stands for, what he's doing, want him to stay in politics and help influence, whether it's the Senate election in Ohio or his own presidential bid in 2024. Um, they want him to be a player. And he certainly has the means to do that should he want to. Um, and they, of course, were not dissatisfied with things that he did post the election. Um, then on the other hand, I do think there are plenty of Republicans, and we certainly saw this if you were watching um, on January 6th and into January 7th, even our elected officials, Mitt Romney comes to mind, Ben Sass comes to mind, um, in the United States Senate that really called his behavior out, right? And were dissatisfied, said this was not enough, this was not presidential, um, that this was a problem. And so once again, just like the Democratic Party, I think it's a party that has fissures and 
we have a lot of rebuilding and a lot of repair to do um, in both parties and as a nation as we go forward. Um, and I just hope we can do it. Well, and I certainly hope that you'll come back and talk to us about Absolutely. it again in the future. Sure. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, everyone uh, of all uh, persuasions, please uh, thank uh, Dr. Sarah Trill for being here with us today. And we welcome you to any of our Humanities in Action programs coming up, any of our adventures and ideas. And a special shout out for just in a half an hour or so, folks, please join us for our wonderful uh, joint production with uh, CU Boulder and uh, the University of Iowa, a 2020 cultural postmortem. We'll be looking at uh, the last last year a little bit differently than we've just been looking at it, um, looking more a little bit at the uh, humanities uh, perspective on that. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, please thank uh, Dr. Sarah Trull for joining us and uh, look for programs for, uh, through the uh, Program for Public Discourse as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, please come back in the Thank future. You. Uh, Thank you for having we'll me. Hopefully there will be more elections, and that's, uh, that's something we there can count. There will be more elections. Good, good. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you next time.